morning. Pastor David here checking in from my basement corner for Tuesday, February 16th for the SBC Daily Word. Today we're going to be looking at James chapter 5 verses 12 to 21. If you have that section of God's Word open, you realize that concludes for us the letter of James. Um, so took yesterday off because of uh, President's Day and some stuff to do with my family and then we're going to wrap up James today. We're going to take Wednesday off and then starting early next week, we're going to begin our next series of SBC Daily Words, which is going to take us through Psalms 120 to 134. So those are known as the Psalms of Ascent. So just each day for 14 uh, different SBC Daily Words, we're going to be looking at uh, each of those Psalms um, individually. But today, we're going to wrap up uh, the letter of James. So James, as we've reminded you um, every time we've gotten together, we think that this is James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote this letter, who became a leader in the church at Jerusalem. He kind of became also this um, recognized authority for Jewish Christians in the New Testament era. And as we saw at the beginning of James chapter 1, the Jewish Christians who are receiving this letter are Jews of the dispersion. They have been, by Roman persecution, scattered from their homelands, and this has brought many trials and many tests into their lives. And James writes this letter to show them how a community, especially a community of Jewish Christians, who commits themselves to following Jesus, can be regarded as faithful to Torah. So, we're kind of in this last paragraph, and one of the things that I often like to do, especially as we're studying a letter, is to do a little bit of review and to kind of, as we've spent so much time looking at every single detail in this letter, if we have faithfully read and interpreted this letter thus far, we'll get to the end and it will just kind of wrap up and make sense. So here's kind of, again, the big idea. I want us to think about James and this letter as being written to this community, and we can kind of identify the different characteristics that the gospel creates within each of these communities. In kind of the first paragraph, verses 1 to 11 is kind of an introduction. Verses 12 to 18 describes this community as those who gladly embrace suffering. Then in verses 19 to 27, they together have habits of obedience. They don't just hear the word, but they do the word. They obey the commands of Jesus found in Scripture. And you could kind of argue that all of chapter 2 is about the sin of partiality and how the gospel creates a Christian community that is characterized by impartiality. So if you read chapter 2 again, you would see that basically every instruction that's given in that chapter is somehow connected to this temptation we have when the world squeezes us into its mold to be guilty of partiality, to showing preference for the wealthy, and to kind of not prefer those who are poor. Then you could also see in all of chapters 3 and 4 about how um, the church is supposed to be characterized by speech that makes for peace. Okay, You could look at every single paragraph in those two chapters and see that what James is really getting at is something that Jesus talked a lot about is speech. And then in the first half of chapter 5, we see that the church, when it follows Jesus, is going to be a place that has compassion for the poor. Now, verses 12 to 21, this is kind of the final paragraph concluding instructions, okay? The first instruction is found in verse 12. James writes this, Above all, my beloved, that's kind of his way of saying, I'm, I'm wrapping things up. Do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. So again, these 
concluding instructions are written to a community. And that community now is going to be characterized by something. And here's the way I would summarize that verse. The church has been graced to tell the truth. Okay? The church has been graced to tell the truth. Now, verses 13 to 18, I'm going to kind of summarize as one section. And again, there's a lot of different details that we could get lost in here in this passage. But here's what I would say. These verses describe the church as being graced to share our troubles. Okay? So, verse 12, the church has been graced to tell the truth. Secondly, verses 13 to 18, the church has been graced to share our troubles. Are any among you suffering? I'm in verse 13. They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the, year, and the earth yielded its harvest. Now, there's a lot there about, okay, prayer, healing, anointing with oil. There's a lot of different rabbits that we could trace down a variety, chase down a variety of trails. But here's what I want you to see in kind of a big picture way. The church here is described as a place where we share our troubles with each other. So if we've got sins that beset us, if we've got sickness that besets us, the church is here described as being graced with the ability to share those troubles. So our sins, the church being a safe place where we can go to trusted leaders within the church family to say, this is what I'm struggling with. To then have sicknesses of a variety of types where we are a part of a community where they want to know what we're going through and we want them to help us bear those burdens. <coughs> Excuse me. So not only has the church <coughs> been graced to tell the truth, the church has secondly been graced to share our troubles. And then finally, the church has been graced to seek those who wander. Verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, here, especially on the heels of describing, one, the church is a community that has been graced to tell the truth. The church has been graced to be a place where we share and we're open about the burdens that we have. Sometimes that community can kind of be made to feel uncomfortable. And sometimes because of the different difficulties that we're dealing with, that causes us to, of our own doing, move away from that community. Now, without compromising the will and desires of that person, James says, the church has been graced to be a community that seeks those who wander because sometimes sickness, sometimes sin, sometimes a lack of honesty in our lives causes us to pull away. And James now concludes with, this admonition, church, you've been graced to not only tell the truth, to not only share our troubles with each other, but finally to, to seek those who wander. So just some concluding applications here in light of these concluding instructions that James gives us. One, 
the church is equipped to be one holy nation. And I'm kind of drawing that from these concluding instructions, but also having looked at the whole book of James, getting ready for these concluding instructions, you can kind of see if you were to sit down and take 25, 30 minutes and read through that you understand that James understands the church as this community that is kind of an alternative society. In other words, it's as Paul says, and as Exodus says, one holy nation. Now, James is not describing the church as as this commune that separates itself from the world, but it's a society, a nation, a community that lives according to a certain ethic so that the watching world can see, I wish the world was like that. So the church caring for the poor, the church telling the truth, the church not using speech in a way that takes away peace. In other words, these are things that we would like to see true of society. And when they aren't, what James calls us to do is to seek to kind of be a part of this micro society that lives according to the way we wish the world was. Stanley Hauerwas in this arena says this, the first task of the church is not to make the world just. Now he's not saying we should care about it, we should should disregard injustice, but he's saying the first task, okay? The first task of the church is not to make the world just. The first task of the church, he says, is to make the world the world. To understand that that as a church, we don't live according to the patterns of the world. Caesar isn't Lord for the church. Joe Biden is not Lord for the church. Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. And one day he will come and set up his kingdom throughout the entire cosmos. And now the church is this advanced settlement. So in the wisdom of Hauerwas, he reminds us that we've got to remember the world is the world and the church is the church, and they are two separate entities. So the church is equipped to be a holy nation. Finally, to be a holy nation, we must be committed to telling the truth. Okay? To telling the truth. To telling the truth about God to telling the truth about the world, to telling the truth about ourselves. As Christians, we must never be afraid of where the truth might lead. This is especially relevant in our day where facts tend to be ignored or skewed for different malevolent purposes. As Christians... As the church of Jesus Christ, we must be supernaturally committed to telling the truth. James, as he concludes this letter, almost quotes verbatim something he likely heard Jesus teach. Matthew 5, 37, let your word be yes, yes, and no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Brothers and sisters, the church, even when the truth might make the church and Christians look bad, must always be committed to telling the truth about God, about the world, and about ourselves. In light of this, Charles Spurgeon gives this exhortation to the church. He says, tear off your masks The church was not meant to be a masquerade. Brothers and sisters, James describes the church as so committed and rooted in following Jesus that even when it comes to telling difficult truths about ourselves, we are supernaturally committed to the truth. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me for these SBC Daily Words through the letter of James. Again, next week, we begin to look at um, Psalm 120. 
as the beginning of the series of the Songs of Ascent that will take us from Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134. I'm looking forward to beginning that uh, next week with you. May grace and peace and everything good be yours.